Let's talk about what we talked about in last week's lesson. Hello? Uh, David said despite what other people are doing, he was going to serve the Lord. Okay. Anything else? Um, yeah, kind of. Um, did definitely talk about, um, some of the, uh, the people out in the world. What was the thrust of the lesson, though? We, we had, had something that we specifically talked about that was kind of the main body of it. Yeah, we talked quite a bit about prayer and modes of prayer in the previous lesson, specifically meditation, uh, crying, and um, just vocal request, so to speak, and the obeisance of, of prayer as well. Um, The uh, the first verse two where it says where where he refers to him as king we talked about quite a bit about what what referring to you know referring to God as Lord or as God or whatever I I feel like it are are rote words most of the time that we use but to refer to someone as king especially in David's time held special significance it held a it, you you placed. Uh, God on a loftier scale. Anything else? All right. Well, that brings us to uh, Psalms chapter six, which talks is going to talk quite a bit about um, similar topics that we've went through, but I think has a little bit different spin on it. When I was researching Psalm chapter six. This particular song did not seem to have any origin in David's life other than maybe some personal problems that he was having or something because not definitely not related to anything that we know uh, based on none of my re uh, any of my research was able to find like if this was linked to a specific event in David's life or whatever but it seemed that from what I was able to find that this was specifically uh, for people that that were experiencing trouble in their life. That, that it's the early the the opening of the psalm says it was to the chief music, musician Neganoth upon Shemineth a psalm of David. So this this was a a psalm delivered directly to this chief musician as a, a to basically more or less to enter into their hymn book. This is. Oddly enough, a lot like any any of the type of songwriting that you that you could see today, um, where you're you're inspired by events around you or a story or something in your own personal life or whatever, and it causes you to write a song. Um, the first verse in chapter says, "O oh Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O oh Lord, for I am weak." O oh Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. David, in how he opens up a lot of these things, is making an appeal to the Lord, not based upon his grace, or not based upon, uh, but upon the mercy of the Lord. Uh, in, in verse 1, he says, Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger. Um... 
David, through this song, was acknowledging that a lot of the poor things that happen um, in our lives are re are related to God's displeasure at how we're at how we're working or not working in our own life. How um, this test, he says, and then, and then he goes on and talks about uh, neither chasing me in that hot displeasure. Don't, don't, please don't make this about something that I have done wrong. This is this is the same as a a, a child's cry when they're asking not to be whipped. They're wanting to put off the punishment and appeal to what? Not appeal to grace. They don't want a permanent removal, but just mercy. I, I, I want to I, I, I want to put this off as long as possible. Just have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. David admits that in whatever they had done there, that they had gotten that they had gotten weakness. We talked a little bit over the last couple of weeks about um, sheep wandering astray, and uh, we've kind of gone on on and off about the shepherd and being outside the sheepfold and all this stuff. And um, there is something to that that I had never really given a lot of thought before. Not only do you, are you outside of the protection of the fold, the protection of the watchful eye of the shepherd, but Substance and exposure and a lot of other things can make you weak. If you're out on, uh, let's say, a, a child or even an adult that um, goes on a hiking trip, maybe carries enough rations for a couple of hours, you know, jaunt to the top of a ridge or a mountain or through some woods, and then finds themselves lost off the path, cannot find their way back, and remains out there for several days, the person that comes out of those woods is much different than the person that went into those. Uh, they have wandered far from the path, and the the lack of sustenance, nighttime temperatures being cooler, uh, daytime temperatures being warmer, uh, animals, insects, um, just a general lack of cleanliness. All of these things attribute to someone who usually, I mean, at the, usually the first first thing they do is hit them with some fluids because they haven't drank enough to make themselves well. Um, they may be running a fever. They may be having some type of shock. All these things attribute to a weak person. So if you're operating outside of the sheepfold, it's not just that you have wandered outside of the influence of God. You've wandered into an area where you spiritually can't survive. That you you're you're in a uh, a spiritual food desert. You're 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 in a you 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 have opened yourself up. To exposure and to weakness, and and David admits he says uh, because if if verse one is to be taken into account as the punishment that's arriving on me is because is of my own doing, we must take into account that he has wandered off the path. Then you take verse two into account, and not only does he want mercy because he doesn't want to stay the punishment, a weak person can't stand a lot of punishment. You take somebody that's been in those conditions. And maybe they run up on a wild animal of some type. Maybe even a wild animal that typically would not be a would not be a problem. All of a sudden, you're much more susceptible to the attacks. Um, I, there was a, a a guy in the barber shop the other day, and we were talking about uh, coyotes. Uh, and coyotes are very they're, they're very skittish animals, and unless they've got a lot of them with them, they don't have a whole lot of boldness of their own. Uh, but Nonetheless, they're pack animals and they're pack dogs. Um, the um, and this guy was telling me that they were uh, him. Him one of one of the kids and their son was uh, was out there um, hunting. They caught climb out of the deer stand at evening time, and they heard something walking up behind them. And it was a coyote. And that coyote was following real close, and he had a little boy there, and the boy couldn't have been much more than six or eight years old, small. And the father picked the boy up, and while the boy was in his arms, the coyote was would, would stay off from him. If he was on the ground, though, he was 
the coyote felt some boldness, said there was some potential for a meal here. And when they finally got out of the woods, they were okay. But this, but th- this story tells you that there is weakness outside of the father, outside of protection. And so it, for, for, you know, a grown man or something, a coyote, I mean, they're dangerous, but you might be able to beat them down. You might be able to win mano e mano with a coyote but you know the danger the dangers of spiritually walking away from god the bible says the the devil is like a lion lions are much larger than coyotes are much larger than most of the apex predators of the united states save maybe your you know grizzly bears or or something of that nature um and lions do the same thing what do they do they wait for the weak the infirmed, the people outside of the group to strike first. So when you allow yourself to get side out of the will of God, know this, that not only are you depriving yourself of a relationship to God, which we talked extensively about in the last class, you're depriving yourself of that relationship, you're also depriving yourself of spiritual health. You're putting, you're, you're guaranteeing yourself a time in ICU on your spiritual health. And then he goes on and says, For my bones are vexed. That means his bone your bones, if you have know anything about physiology or maybe even done some butchering or whatever, your the bones are the foundational structure of the human body. Without it we would be formless blobs uh, with no ability to move on our own. Your bones make are are the are the underlying for lack of a better term, skeleton of of everything that uh, that makes you up. When you frame up a house, what are you doing? You're building the bones of the house. You're 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 putting two before and you don't just use whatever you can find. No, you want good strong wood without a whole lot of bends in it, without a whole lot of knots in it. When you go above windows and doorways, you want to make sure that you're doubling up so that there's a lot of strength in those areas where there's passage through. When you put up trusses, if anybody's ever seen trusses before they get covered with with with, with metal or with, with shingles or whatever, um, they've got uh, usually a triangular structure. You'll see them. That not only are they themselves a triangle, within that triangle are other triangles. I actually was watching uh, Mythbusters one time, and, and uh, Adam Savage on Mythbusters says, if you want strength, look for triangles. Triangles are foundational strength things. So uh, th- those make up the uh, the strength of a house. Uh, but David is saying that that foundational strength, the thing that he could rest all his weight upon, the thing that he thought that he could rely on, has what? Has become the least valuable thing to him. Some, think about somebody with osteoporosis. Osteoporosis, what does it do? It, it, there, there are tiny... Swiss cheese type holes in your bones and what does that mean that means if you have a fall or if you take even any kind of sudden jarring movement chances for breaks go up because your bones are thinner and thinner and a lot of time the problem with osteoporosis is that process does not get better with time in fact it increases and so your chances of having these breaks to your very foundation are there and and David David say and well, let's think about foundational scripture things David saying that his his spiritual foundation had been wrought. How many people that are saved have what what is the most foundational thing for a saved person? Your salvation. The the, the thing that that you can go back again and again and again and review and rely upon. That is the foundation of the Christian body. What is what is the armor of God say that salvation is? It's the helmet of salvation. It is the it is the most protected element. And David says, when I revisit foundational things like that, even though, let's, let's say, talk about foundational truths, there's no strength there. He's gotten so far off the mark that revisiting things that used to be comforting, used to renew himself, used to, is, when all else failed, this is what I can rely upon, they disappear. They've become, they, they've become moot, or they've become things that you question, that you wonder about. That you lie awake at night thinking, what am I going to do? How is it? How 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 is this? And, and and the comfort is lost there. My soul is sore vexed, but thou art, lo- but thou, O Lord, how long? He says, my soul is sore vexed. Now, when you vex someone's soul, it is a, 
it is an it is an attack it is a it is a taxing of that person's inner being um Trying to think of a of a, of a, of a, of a solid a solid scriptural advance. Uh, 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 I would say Jesus's soul was probably uh, was, was vexed. Jared, do you have a question? Yeah, Lot vexed his soul with. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it, it was uh, Lot found himself in a place where his uh, where his action. Well, we're not even sure that Lot necessarily took participation in the actions around him but seeing and appealing and allowing that stuff around himself vexed his soul made him weaker despite two actual men we'll just say men of God because they're referred to as angels I think they were Godhead but let's just let's just refer to them as they're referred to in scripture despite these divine beings showing up and telling Lot, hey, there's going to be destruction. Lot lingered. How far away from God do you have to be? And and this goes even further. Okay, let's go back to our analogy of being lost. Let's say that you're lost. And then you wander up. This is probably like horror movie fodder here, but you wander up on a cabin full of... of of cannibals or hillbillies or whatever else um, and these people take you in as one of their own you find yourself engaging in the debauchery that they have there now let's think about the spiritual life here let's compare here when you find yourself far away from God not only are you hungry you're starving you're weak and you will accept help from anyone who's out there with you the goats the wolves and let's just take the goats for instance. Those are those are usually where lost people are, are, are equated. There, a sheep will take up with a herd any herd that it can find. We used to have a cow named Bessie, and, and Bessie was a pretty good cow, but she liked to get out a lot. And what did she like to do? She didn't have any other cow friends to hang out with. So she would go over the ridge to our neighbor's horse farm and hang out with the horses. Why? Because Bessie was a herd animal. Cows are herd animals. They like to be with other cows. That's why you, when you see a field of cows, there ain't just usually a handful. It's dozens, if not hundreds of them. Now, Bessie knew that she needed comfort, and she couldn't get comfort of other cows. And when you're out away from the Lord, you can't get comfort from other sheep or the Lord. So where do you turn? You turn to the horses, just like Bessie did. <laughs> the things that are, these are close enough to what I'm looking for, but when you just look right down to them, I mean, you, you, in fact, the genuses are not even the same. Horses, uh, they uh, was it, they're equine, and you have bovine. Now they're both mammals, and that's about as close as we're going to get. But they're not the same. And the goats and the wolves that hang out in our spiritual environment, those aren't your people. But when you're weak and you're tired and you're hungry, you'll turn to anything you can get to get food, to get sustenance, to fill up the part that's, that, that's messed up. And what does that do? It doesn't bring you closer to God. It drives you further and further and further away. It makes you susceptible to predators. You know what? A lot. You, you know why zebras have stripes? I've read that zebras have stripes so that they can hide themselves better from predators. The predators in that area see a lot sometimes in shades of blacks and whites, and they lay down in the grass, and all of a sudden, black and white stripes look like run the grass. But let's just say, for the sake of our cow argument here, that you threw Bessie out in with the zebras. Now, Bessie's black and white, but Bessie was mottled black and white, big old white spots and stuff, and that and the same thing. You know, it would be easier for a predator to pick that animal out of the group than any of the rest of them. And when the devil comes back roaring as a lion, as he does, as the scripture says he does, it is easier for him to pick the one sheep out of the herd of goats than anything else. Goats and sheep, they seem similar. They're so different. I've raised both. I know what I'm talking about. They're, they're totally different animals. In fact, I'll tell you this, goats are gentler and nicer 
and prettier animals than sheep are. Sheep are stupid, they're mean, and they're very disobedient, in my experience. And what does that tell you about us? That means that lost people are pliable and easily moved, and saved people are stubborn and mean. And that bears out pretty well. Um, <laughs> um, let's see. Um, I don't know where I'm. I've lost my place here. Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for Thy mercy's sake. Now I don't think that He is calling for capital S salvation here. When you have gotten so far away from the Lord that you're that you're found that you're weak. Your foundational structure is completely rocked, and you've taken up with whoever you can find to take up with. You need some saving. You need somebody to reach down into the mire and drag you up and bring you back to where you where, where you were before. And when you're this far gone, your spirit holds no sway over your flesh any longer. Your spirit is in ICU and it's on life support. It is there only by the grace of God. And it will take the mercy of God. Here it says, Deliver me, deliver, return, O Lord, deliver my soul, save me for thy mercy's sake. Save me not for me, not for the value that I hold, save me for thy mercy's sake. This is, this is, again, throwing yourself at the feet of the king. This is, again, saying that, God, you hold all the cards. And if you hold all the cards, you're the only one that can, that can make a difference. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? Now, he makes this appeal about save me, save me for your sake, and this is very similar. When I was reading this, is it, it reminded me a lot of when God asked Moses, said Moses, the people are the children of Israel are the worst. Um, and how about I just go in there and I'll send the death angel through and we'll wipe all them out and we'll make a nation out of you. How does that sound? And I'm sure that was very flattering for Moses. Um, I mean, who, who wouldn't it be? But Moses said this. He says, he said, you can't do that, dear Lord, um, because if it will look to the nations round about that you led your children out of Egypt to slaughter them in the wilderness, for them to all die in the wilderness. Who's gonna? Who who is who is going? What? How is that going to uplift you? How you're right. You're right in the idea that you have, God. It, it is. It, and by right, I mean it is righteous. It is. It, it is the thing to do. They deserve what's coming to them, and they did get it. None of those people <laughs> made it into the promised land. None of them. Not a single one, save Joshua and Caleb. That included Moses, by the way. The one that God wanted to make a nation out of. Um, two people. But God said, there, there's no glory for you in that. And I think David is making a very similar appeal here. He's throwing himself on the mercy of Christ. He's not, and he's saying, save me because of thy mercy. He said, because in death, in my death, there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave, who shall, who shall give thee thanks? He's saying, how, if I am dead... If I am long and gone, who's going to lift you up? How is that going to bring praise and glory to yourself? Now, and I've made this claim many times because the Bible says it, we serve a jealous God. God likes to be praised. Why? Not because he's, you know, a, a pompous, self-filled uh, deity. No, he created everything. He deserves it. He earned it. Of course we should praise him because without without him we have no life. Without without with without him we have no existence. And so he's saying, Who's gonna give you thanks if I'm dead? Which also, this is the next point, leads me to believe again that this is not David through a psalm calling for capital S salvation. Um, David is is saying here now we know from the latter in the scriptures that if you can if you 
or a saved person, if you continue to claim that you're one of God's and yet you run off on your own on, on your own thing long enough, God has no obligation to you. He will take you out of play, so to speak. Think about the olive branches that had to be cut free and thrown into the fire. I don't think that's people going to hell because why? First of all, saved people can't go to hell. They can't lose their salvation. And if you're an olive branch, aren't you connected to the tree? Which means you're connected to God. So what must be the correlation between the two? It must be that some branches, once they're grafted in, don't produce anything. And they're useless. And they have to be cut free. I have a peach tree out in my front yard. It doesn't produce any but these little or ornamental peaches, which are just about as useful as a three-legged horse. Um, but... It, it For a while there, it had some branches that were low to the ground and that were dead, and I had to get out there with a chainsaw, and I pruned it up. I got up, and it was healthier this year than it's ever been. Nice green leaves coming out on it. It didn't shed its leaves early like it had been before. It got health from the pruning of the vine, and God has to do the same thing. He said, we have to shed the dead weight. We're not here to drag people along. So we'll trim the tree, and those people will go on home. And David said, please don't bring me to death, because where's the praise in that? I, I am willing to make this effort. I am weary with my growing all the night. I make my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Mine eye is consumed because of grief. It waxeth old because of my enemies. Now, verse 6, we see the repentant David trying to make a, yet another appeal to God on the, um, on, the, on, the, on the basis of his cries. Now, we talked about cries in the last lesson. That is, that is you in a very visceral and, and even, and again, I don't believe in a whole lot of emotion and all that stuff, but in a very emotional way, appealing to God. And that's this type of cry. He says, he's, so far, he's gone so far out, but remember, David is the initiator of this conversation with God. Now, can we initiate our salvation? No, that is not what I'm saying, those here and those watching. But what I am saying is this, we can, if we are one of God's, it is, it is our job to initiate conversations with Him. It is our job. That 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 is what prayer is. And remember, who's initiating? David's making the initiation here. David's making the appeal. David's, and, he's, and, and not only an appeal of, oh, please, Lord, help me. I'm in a bad bad situation. No, he, he, he makes, uh, he has some, uh, I, uh, it could be for real, but I'm sure this is, what do they call it, simile, uh, where, where, you, where you exaggerate a little bit, or uh, hyperbole. There you go. I knew Jarrett would come up with it. Um, but this is this is a a uh, narrative device in which you say something that is wildly greater than what it is. It's you know it's uh, it, uh, uh, somebody says, well, "Would you do this thing?" And you say, "Well, there ain't enough money in the world." I'm sure there is. I'm sure there. But you're, what the what the, the the statement you're making is, you don't have enough money to pay me to do that. That's hyperbole. And David was saying, "What what is that here? I am weary with my growing. He's tired." We've already discussed how weak he already is spiritually, but now he's physically weak. He is, he's, I'm, I'm weary with my groaning, and that groaning, remember, this could be much like Jesus' gro groaning in the Garden of Gethsemane and the meditation we were talking about. I am weary with that opening personal link with God. All the night I make my bed to swim... I water my couch with tears. Basically saying, I have cried so much, my mattress is no longer a mattress. It's a sponge. It's a pool. I, ha I have wept until I cannot weep anymore. This is my eye is consumed because of grief. It waxeth old because of all mine enemies. He says, I, basically, he's cried until he can't cry no more. This is, this is the, he has wrung out all the physicality of the emotion. He can't go any further with that. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Now, we talked about linking up with the goats, the lost traveler linking up with the crazed people in the woods, the, uh, 
the weak person seeking out help from those that aren't don't truly have your best interest at heart and David is saying what I reject all of that I depart from me you work iniquity. I am walking away from that fold so this is again just like the um, just like the man in um, in the parable this is him going back home who made the first level of effort it was not the father in that parable why because that was not a story about salvation it was a story about a saved person finding their way back home and David says here I'm putting away all my all the people of iniquity I'm putting all that I'm taking all that stuff and I'm throwing it to the side to find my way back home and the 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 rich man's son he did the exact same thing he says what am I doing here why am I wishing that I could eat these things when servants at my father's house eat better than this I'm gonna go home I'm gonna go find my way home but it is our job to do that and what is this it's just like in that story when he makes his way home and the father sees him afar off what does he do he runs and he falls on his neck and he kisses him and he gets a garment puts around it and puts that ring back on his hand which is was probably a signet ring which meant that was his station you're a son and you're back home and it doesn't matter what you've done in the past I'm restoring you back to that place and then they threw a big feast this is this is David's acknowledgement of what happens when you make that effort he says the Lord hath heard my supplication the Lord will receive my prayer you put forth the effort you'll get something out let all my enemies be ashamed and sore vexed let them return and be ashamed suddenly so David has gone full circle from being joined up with those people to viewing the same people that fed him that clothed him that took care of him that left him spiritually weak and now they're, they're his, his enemies that they, they, they he's, he's come he's come fully around in this in this uh, in this psalm we've got to find a way we, we have to, we have to be the ones to make the effort the Lord God and I can't expect I can't say this enough. The Lord God's done done everything he needs to do. Everything that is required of him. And some things that are not required of him. God had a perfectly good system. The law, as stringent as it was, it was a system that worked. And it worked for thousands of years. And then Jesus was sent to pay the full price of that. He's done done everything he needs to do. It is up to, it is up to us to keep ourselves close and if you decide to wander off let me tell you folks if you don't find your way back quick you're gonna get hungry if you don't find and, and, and if you don't find food you're gonna stay hungry and you're gonna link up with the first person you come around why do people that get away from God's people all of a sudden link up with churches they how did they get off on that religion they're hungry and they're looking for food and they'll wander into whatever barn they can find if it's a hog lot if it's a cow pasture if it's a horse pasture it doesn't matter there's food there, and it's something they can get their teeth into, and they will do it every time. Are there any questions or comments on Psalms chapter 6 before we close? All right, well, uh, next week we'll look at Psalms chapter 7. You all have a good week. Thank you.